Right, hello, good morning and welcome to the Christ Central Morning Devotional. I'm Alistair Semple, I'm one of the people who's part of the group here, and I'm leading us through our study in Luke's Gospel. And we have a largish passage primarily around John the Baptist. So I'm just going to pick up the scriptures and Do that. Right. So I'll, I'll read this passage and um, we'll then come back to the thought. And most of what's going to be said today is simply the, the, the scripture passage itself because of its length. So we start in Luke 3, verse 1, where it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Aturia and Trachonitis, and Lysenius, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it's written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping of your repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we've got Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God could raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none and Anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and the fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then with many other words, John exhorted people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things that he'd done, Herod added this to them all. He locked up John in prison. So there isn't a lot to look at there. The people looking for a Messiah and wondering whether John's going to be it and John pointing to one beyond him. The content of some of what it was that John was teaching, the people who had actually responded, tax collectors, hated people. If he was saying that normal people were a brood of vipers, what sort of invective, what sort of insult, what sort of critique might he have had for people who were collaborators? He actually speaks to them plainly and doesn't treat them worse than anyone else. To the extent that some soldiers asked him, what should we do? 
there's good reason to believe that these aren't Jewish soldiers, but Roman soldiers. Because one of the ways of supplementing your income as a soldier was to accuse people of things which they hadn't done and threatened to imprison them. And he says to them, a straight answer. This is the part where you see the beginning, this idea that actually to be a child of Abraham, you need to be careful. That doesn't give you a privilege that God can't take away from you. This paraphrase, because it's not exact word for word from Isaiah. It's got pretty much what he says, but the way it's quoted is not like reading from a scroll is taking it from memory not missing anything but making it clear to the people around them and then finally this long historical introduction which is very precise and has some issues of its own in it because there wasn't a time when both Annas and Caiaphas were both officially the high priest very interesting to dig into some of these things but it's from this passage that you have a certainty that the year in question is actually 27 AD and it leads to a clarity that the year of crucifixion for Jesus was AD 30 three years later it's at this point that Jesus is at the start of his ministry. Now, here's my thought. In the 15th year of reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. It seems that either John's ministry really begins at this point or it particularly kicks off with an emphasis at this point and he's about 30 years old here's the one with the words of the angel over him the words of god that have led him out into the wilderness for we don't know how long but to become a man well age 13, 14, he's now age 30. What's he been doing in those years? Simply, we don't know. But on Sunday, I had the opportunity of uh, preaching. And in, in the focus of that preach, I was looking at signs of success and using John the Baptist as a, an indicator of what success might look like. And here's the thought. On the road to success, there are no shortcuts. So what does that mean for us? Well, John would have spent the best part of maybe 17 years, much in isolation, much in prayer, much in fasting, much in study. There's even a possibility that John was part of the community of the Essenes. And it's from that community, the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls that we find the oldest version of Isaiah. It's the one that's literally the version that we have in our Bibles. And he was clearly familiar with it. And certainly it is the passage which is picked up to describe what he's doing it comes from Isaiah. The early church treated Isaiah as the gospel, or at least containing the gospel. They didn't have the gospels because they hadn't been written yet. But that earliest church and the church fathers thereafter saw that book of Isaiah as being essentially the gospel in the Old Testament and you could see and read in and find 
all the characters that you needed to and the reasons why they were there and God's plan of salvation as in the book of Isaiah. So where are we? Long periods where things, well, perhaps aren't our main event, where we're on the edge, where we're learning life, where we're doing life, where we're in places where, I don't know, it feels like we haven't really started properly yet, or there's still something bigger ahead, or who knows? On the, short, uh, on the road to success, there are no shortcuts. For John, by the time it came to be meeting his cousin more properly, um, this may have been when Jesus came, actually one of the few occasions that he saw him as a man. And it was for this point that John lived his life. And, and then it stopped. And then it stopped. Oh, pulled the wrong thing. <laughs> Sorry. But it was this passage that when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he'd done, Herod added a few more. He locked up John in prison. John's overlap with Jesus, very short, under a year. At the start of Jesus' ministry, John is finished. And John's ministry didn't fully start until just before the start of Jesus' ministry. So, make of that what you will. So that's my thought for our day.